everybody is still sort of trying to figure things out. Uh, we have uh, we put together an eclectic panel that brings together a whole bunch of different perspectives on where we go from, where we've been, where we, how we got here, and where we might go from here. Uh, we're gonna. Um, WIDA is, in general, as folks know, a nonpartisan, impartial forum for the open and free discussion of trade, and I think that uh, that is more needed than ever today as we try to understand uh, the global economy, as we try to figure out where we're going. Uh, back in September, again, before uh, we knew the outcome of the election, we actually started a, dis a discussion called uh, Next Gen Trade, where we're going to look at the future of trade, getting out of just the debate that's going on today, but try to look to the future. And the first piece that we actually published on that initiative was on 3D printing and some of the implications of that. Uh, my friend Bill Lane was actually one of the people who highlighted that uh, issue for me several months ago. Uh, so we wanted to look at the future of trade and where we, where the economy is going. We held an event with uh, uh, McKinsey and Harvard University looking at uh, where the economy is going. Uh, and we look, hope to have that conversation with all of you. We, we welcome your inputs. Uh, we want you to bring ideas to us. Uh, if you have people who might write for our website, americastradepolicy.com, we welcome having them on our website and publishing some of those ideas about where we go from here on trade. Uh, one of the initiatives we'll be looking at is supply chains and global value chains. Uh, we're going to be looking at regional uh, discussions about trade. We're going to be looking at technology. We're going to be looking at the whole panoply of economic issues and trade issues that we should be looking at into the future. Uh, and we welcome all of your participation. With that, uh, I'm going to turn the discussion over to uh, our board member, Audrey Erickson, uh, with me, Johnson Nutrition. Thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, I'm very grateful for all our panelists. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, oh, this is <coughs> Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. I'm Audrey Erickson with Me Johnson Nutrition. Me Johnson Nutrition is a leading global pediatric nutrition company, and our mission is to give each child their best start in life. As it turns out, we operate in more than 50 countries around the world, touching the lives of infants, preschoolers, young children, and their many families each and every day. Our company depends on international trade not only to supply the high quality ingredients that enable countless children to achieve their maximum potential, but also our employees, many of whom, as it turns out, live in rural America and depend on trade for their livelihoods and also to contribute to their communities and their economies. And it's truly my pleasure today to serve as the moderator of our August expert panel to talk about this recent election, which all of us know has substantially impacted not only the US, but also the global dialogue on trade. And we have convened an expert panel, each with very different views and perspectives, because as you know, WIDA welcomes a variety of views on the topic of trade, not only, as Ken noted, um, how we got to where we are today, but very importantly, where we're headed in the future, both um, with respect to the trade agenda, but also politically. So first, let me introduce our panelists this morning. Um, and I'll just do their introductions in the order in which they'll be presenting this morning. We're very pleased to have with us this morning um, Michael Ramlett, who is founder and CEO of Morning Consult. As many of you may know, Morning Consult is a nonpartisan digital media and survey research company. Um, it uh, provides news coverage and also survey research and data technology tools for politics, policy, and business. Uh, this morning, Mr. Ramlett will focus on the American electric and polling data in the 2000 election. But I understand he has news that's hot off the press, so hang on, <laughs> only you will have it. Following, uh, we're very honored to have Congressman Jerry Weller with us this morning. As many of you know, Congressman Weller represented the 11th Congressional District in Illinois for 16 years in the House of Representatives. He served uh, as a Republican on the House Ways and Means Committee and also its subcommittee on trade, as well as the Committee on International Relations. Next, we will hear uh, from Simon Rosenberg. 
He's the founder and president of New Democratic Network. And New Democratic Network is a leading center-left think tank and advocacy organization. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg will be speaking about the politics of trade broadly, but also from the perspective of Democrats specifically. We look forward to his remarks. And finally, uh, Mr. Bill Lane, who many may know as a 40-year veteran of the company Caterpillar. He was a long-standing um, global affairs director for government relations for Caterpillar. And he's also president emeritus of the U.S. Leadership, uh, Global Leadership Coalition. And we're going to be counting on Bill to be speaking about the future of trade policy in the wake of the 2016 election. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panel and Mr. Michael Brown. All right, if it's okay, I'm gonna go live in front of the screen and hopefully be a little bit more interactive. Um, I never anticipated after the election that I have to start every presentation by saying that the polling industry is not that. Uh, so to draw a little bit more of a response than it's it's not dead for a, a multitude of reasons. One, because at the end of the day, there were some outlets that did get the election right. Uh, Morning Council was one of them. We were the only national media outlet to nail the popular vote on the head. Uh, well, some kind of saw it as a 12-point race, like you kind of consistently saw it having and flowing. You had two really well-defined candidates that everyone knew, uh, and at a larger level, historically, uh, no one liked. So what you had was a really kind of close election at the end of the day. Um, I just want to kind of dive into it, um, but to give you guys a little bit more perspective, if I can turn my clicker on. Morning Consult conducts over a thousand interviews a day of the registered voter population, and over a thousand interviews of the general public, 18 plus. So what I'm going to walk through today is actually a set of different questions we've asked over the last year. Uh, a lot of the data that you're going to see today is from a 10,000 person poll, so this is a margin of error of less than 2%. What we were looking at was kind of the, what we thought was going to be kind of a, a larger trade agenda around TBP and the lame duck. Uh, so a lot of this data comes from that poll, as well as our weekly poll with Politico and Morning Consult. So that's kind of the, the hot off the news press information. Um, what we see is really valuable in this space is kind of being able to enlighten the conversation with numbers. So I'm going to kind of talk broadly about trade in the American voter. And then obviously the North American Free Trade Agreement came, a lot, came up a lot on the campaign trail, uh, and, and certainly uh, was talked about as being revisited. Uh, we've got some inter interesting information there, and then specifically in the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership space. Um, but broadly speaking, and, and if you want to access any of this information after the presentation, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, uh, you can visit Morning Consul Intelligence. But what's here is really just an overview. Of if you're going to ask people, generally speaking, are you in favor of free trade? You could call it fair trade. You could call it free trade. Uh, but this is sort of putting the best foot forward in terms of what I would tell you Word to work with the American public on, on trade. And even in this space, you know, generally speaking, a majority of Americans support free trade, about 57% in concept. This will get really interesting when we actually dive into NAFTA and into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because at the highest level they support free trade, but when you start to get into the details and the consequences, this is all of a sudden where you see the electorate split. So from our perspective, it's not just about kind of what people think about in the aggregate, but because we do 2,000 person polls at a minimum, we're able to tell you about subpopulations. So what's interesting about trade, uh, it, it really follows who's in the White House. It also follows uh, a broader kind of age and gender split. So among men, on almost all of these questions, men are more supportive of trade than women. If you look at most of these, younger or kind of Gen X uh, adults are more supportive of trade. The older you are, the less likely you are supportive of trade. And then specifically, in a lot of these questions before the election, you saw a lot more Democratic support for trade, sort of recognizing that, that President Obama had been supportive of TPP and pushing that agenda. And I think what's going to be interesting to see here after the election is how does that flip? To give you some context, right track, wrong track flipped dramatically after the election. Uh, you'll probably see kind of the coalition settle here uh, in the next month. But if I was going to kind of lay out the, the sort of dichotomy here is it's a macro versus micro conversation. At a macro level, people think that trade's good for the U.S. economy. That's what this slide is showing is you know, there's, a, there's generally speaking a plurality of folks. It's, it's definitely not a definitive. Uh, there, there's case by case instances here. But I think where you see the biggest difference is that the likelihood that it's going to negatively impact jobs is, is a much greater plurality. 
So I think there's the challenge of at a high level, 54,000, you know, folks think it's good for the economy. At an individual level, they're very concerned about what it means for their job and what it means for the jobs around them. So I think that's sort of the, the messaging challenge of you know, those that are not necessarily supportive of the agreements today, they have a much easier messaging game. It's harder to sort of pontificate on the benefits of trade when it's an aggregate. Yeah, I think in DC we love to roll out studies that show the number of jobs or that show the number of uh, suppliers impacted. But at the end of the day, the American voter uh, is at some level self-interested and I think they're more concerned about sort of the localized impact at a, at a jobs level. And I'm sure that the, the panel's gonna have a lot to say about that question. Uh, in this case, sort of, I think the next level question that, that we have always sort of thought about in the trade conversation is what is the role of the United States in a broader global economy? And I think this is sort of an interesting slide where it, it would be really curious to see historical data here because right now it's sort of split. You know, I think some of the arguments in favor of TPP was that we need to engage in the Asian uh, region in large part because it's a counterweight to the involvement of China in that space. I'll show you a slide later where I think China is kind of the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room when we talk about how the American public feels about trade. But from our perspective, this really shows you know, there's a lot of opportunity. You know, a third of Americans haven't made up their mind on this question in terms of the role of the US in the broader global economy and trade, um, but also recognize this is a real knife fight for those that do or do not necessarily support the expansion of, of, of trade agreements. From our perspective, the North American Free Trade Agreement has been a fascinating case study. This is only gonna be four slides of what is a larger presentation of over 75 slides. We went into it and asked the American public not only how do you feel about the impact of NAFTA to the United States, but how do you think it impacted both Mexico and Canada across a number of different measures? To give you guys just kind of a high level overview of, of what we found, uh, in this case, you know, we saw that you know, it's really still a split 38-37 in terms of support uh, or oppose kind of the impact on, on the U.S. economy, if you thought it was good or bad. Uh, if you kind of take a step further and look at the jobs angle, this is where it's much more definitive. So by an eight point margin, um, Americans, and specifically American voters, feel like NAFTA has negatively impacted jobs. Um, certainly this is a topic that came up on the campaign trail, um, but hopefully, uh, you know, for those of you that are, that are particularly interested in the expansion of trade agreements, uh, and or the kind of maintaining NAFTA as it is. Uh, we had a poll here just right after election day with Politico in which we went into asking what were the priorities for the next Congress or what would you like to see the priorities be for the next administration, the next Congress. Despite all of the campaign rhetoric on NAFTA and kind of revisiting the, the trade agreements that are already in place, uh, it's you know right here at the bottom, 39% in terms of uh, wanting to see that be a priority in the next Congress. You know, compare that rather dramatically. This is of just Republicans. So the reason why I just chose Republicans, obviously in this case, uh, Republican Congress, you know, House and Senate, as long as a, as well as administration. So even among Republicans, going back into renegotiating trade deals is not something that's finding widespread support or necessarily prioritization. Is there a question? And sorry, you guys can interrupt me. Otherwise, I'm going to sound like Teddy Ruxan and just keep going. You guys got to laugh. <laughs> I'm gonna keep flying then. So what's interesting here, you know, not surprisingly, national security. I think we were really surprised how much healthcare popped. Uh, if you looked at kind of the last three days, one of the big projects we did, we did a 25,000 person exit poll at Politico. And if you wanna know why Trump won, it comes down to only one thing. It comes down to jobs. Uh, maybe at a, at a secondary level, it's security issues, but jobs, he had a much more pronounced advantage than Clinton in the closing kind of and this is 25,000 actual voters. So they had to have voted early, they had to have voted on election day, and it was more pronounced in the states of Michigan, in the states of uh, Wisconsin, and kind of those key areas where you thought kind of the big blue wall was unlikely to fall. It actually turned out to be more pronounced that jobs was the top issue, and in that space, Trump did better. And I think what you're seeing is that it's sort of reflected here in terms of the type of issues that the, even the Republican base that turned out for him would like to see them address in the next administration. The TPP space, I think, is really fascinating. Uh, one reason I think it's so interesting is how much conversation it gets in BC and how little conversation it gets outside of BC. 41% of Americans have heard nothing at all about TPP. So even though there were signs that appeared at the convention halls, they literally have no idea what those signs said. Nothing. So my favorite thing in DC is sort of what we're able to do with the polling data is oftentimes either prove what you should otherwise not need to prove um, or disprove things that are assumed to be true. Uh, in this case, I think a lot of people felt like TPP was sort of 
top of mind, it wasn't an American public. Monday Night Football and other things <coughs> were much more likely to be on their mind. 31% uh, of Americans had not heard much. This is the crowd that likes to think they're informed, but they don't want to admit they haven't heard anything about it. Turns out this crowd, tons of men. Tons of men. It, I mean, seriously, like, if no one has explained to you this in polling, men are always more likely to venture a guess. They're much less likely to say, I don't know. It's like directions. Uh, <laughs> what we see is, is really interesting here is this is probably made up of more highly educated, so think like bachelor's degree, post bachelor's degree. is like, oh yeah, I know about TVP. Uh, they don't really know about TVP. Uh, what is interesting here, only about 28% of the population has necessarily heard a lot or some. I assume this is all populations inside of major urban areas. Uh, and a lot of these instances, I think what's fascinating uh, is just how much education needs to take place. Because if you look at kind of the rhetoric on the campaign trail, and this is, you know, for those of you that, that want to advocate on these issues, you hear a lot of the campaign rhetoric, but you don't necessarily hear sort of that ability to break down those overall, you know, tens of millions of jobs numbers or tens of millions of dollars in indirect economic impacts. The, the ability to localize that information, but then also get it out has sort of been, I think, the big lift uh, for advocates of trade. What I think is also fascinating in this space is sort of this overall question of, of support opposed. So <laughs> despite the fact that a, a vast majority of them have not heard much uh, at all, or, or not at all, they still venture a guess as to whether or not uh, they oppose. Granted, there's 45% uh, that say don't know, no opinion. Um, but again, this is kind of a 50-50 knife fight, uh, where I think that it's going to come down to messaging long term on trade. There's not necessarily been, a, I think, a resonating message. There's this challenge in which I think the message that's good for the economy is penetrated, but there's also the message that it's not necessarily been good for, for some individual jobs or particular sectors uh, that's penetrated through, <laughs> penetrated through. And then I kind of tee up for the panel, the, the last discussion here is who we are trading with matters a lot to the American <coughs> So in this instance, we asked whether or not you think trade with each of the following has helped the U.S., hurt the U.S., or has not made much of a difference either way. Uh, and this is where you see China is kind of the, the overarching boogeyman. I think one of the challenges from a messaging standpoint for the, the folks who've advocated for TPP is that anytime you talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership or, or an Asian boat trading bloc, immediately Americans think of China. And I think that the, the results here are pretty clear. 53% of Americans think that trade with China has hurt the United States, only 18% think it's helped the United States. Uh, you see kind of similar underwater numbers with, with Mexico, India, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam. So you, you're talking about trading partners who probably the average American does not necessarily feel like it's a, it's a fair trade uh, on the surface. Whereas you see kind of Western European allies get a much higher uh, and rosier perspective. So kind of it's one of those fascinating things with, with uh, NAFTA you know, the, Me the Mexico component of it underwater in terms of help to hurt uh, versus the trade with Canada, uh, the highest kind of uh, contrast between two countries. So that's kind of the, the TIA, the overarching goal here is, is to, I guess, spur discussion on the panel. Um, I imagine there's a lot of things that uh, you can draw from. So thank you.